recording it to the recording has begun okay mm -hmm. and i would like to start by uh informing all uh webinar participants who is with us of course i just have a few ideas about rob because he has been doing so many fascinating things in his professional life that it would be impossible it would be too time consuming and it would uh, limit the time for mm -hmm. our for Rob's reflections or our participation in the process of going from classroom to boardroom. So, uh, IATEFL has been with IAT, uh, sorry, uh, Rob has been with IATEFL uh, uh, International for almost four years now. Uh, he is a joint coordinator for IATEFL Business English Special Interest Group. Uh, and uh, he, he is also joint web and online coordinator for uh, IATF Business English Special Group. And he has been this online coordinator for four years already. Um, he is also uh, a managing partner of Business Language Training Institute uh, and co-founder of independent authors and publishers group. Uh, so he has been there for, all, for almost five years. Uh, also, he's a founder of uh, English Foreign Language Talks, um, uh, for, uh, and uh, he has been here for, all, for over six years uh, in Gdańsk Pomeranian uh, uh, district. He is, to begin with, professional English language teacher uh, and trainer, of course, uh, uh, worldwide. He's been active for 14 years in this area. He has been professional speaker at uh, our IATF Poland conferences, but also at IATF uh, International. And he owns our online language center. And he has been here for 18 years already. Uh, um, and being an advanced communication skills facilitator and author and uh, online language, uh, online language um, services provider, he, I'm sure that he will inspire us with how to go, how to make our students reach the stage of becoming the members of, of board. So over to you, Rob. I'm eliminating well, myself. And <laughs> <laughs> great. <visually. laughs> well, thank you. And sorry, I do too many things. I, I have to do uh, less things to make shorter introductions. But it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm so happy that IATEFL Poland has invited me. Um, IATEFL Poland is one of the greatest IATEFL groups around. If you're not a member yet, you should be. So, let's get started. And first thing I want to say, just um, as a little caveat, I think that A1 and A2 level classes are regular English classes, and this is my opinion and others. When we get into B1 and B2, I think we can make a migration into business English. But I really feel that true business English classes should be when you hit the C1 and C2 level and above. But of course, we're getting students at B1, B2 level, and we have to deal with them. So deal with them. And I don't care if you're a native speaker or a non-native speaker. I make no distinction. As long as you're a good teacher, that's all that matters. Okay? So um, my predecessor at BSIG, who you probably know, Evan Frendo, always says that business English is an umbrella term. I like to call it a hypernym which means it's an umbrella term. But I like to call it a blanket term because you look at what we have. We have English students who are studying business, business people studying English, business people studying business skills, business students studying English. We have freelancers, we have in-company, we have university. We're all over the place. So really, Business English is a huge blanket term. It covers a lot. There's a lot more I could add here. Now, what we need to discover is, first thing, are we teaching skills or are we teaching language 
or are we teaching both? And what we need to decide, are we acting as a teacher or are we going to act as a coach? We may do both again, but we need to be able to identify this in ourselves. So are you a business English teacher or an English teacher at a business? Because there is a big distinction, okay? So let's talk a little bit. <coughs> now, it depends on where you are in your career. I know we're all different places. I see some people here that are coming in that I know um, from around the world. I know some of you are freelancers. You might be giving classes at a coffee shop. You might be giving classes in a nice corporate building. You could have an office or you could be online. We need to look at our level of professionalism is the point I'm trying to make. For instance, if you were taking your truck to be fixed, are you going to take it to a guy on the side of the road who doesn't have the facilities or the knowledge, or are you going to take it to the more expensive dealership? And because it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, where are you going to go for your exam? So we need to think about our professionalism because when we start getting into business English teaching, business English facilitating, coaching, whatever, we should be looking at a higher value. We're giving our students much more. And making this transition from a general English teacher into a business English teacher, mentor, tutor, coach, facilitator, whatever, we're offering more quality, we're offering a higher level, and we should be charging a higher price. There's the good news. The first good news, we should make more. But what I want to talk about today, <coughs> excuse me, I don't have COVID, I have seasonal allergies, so I may keep coughing. Um, why are our students studying these days? Are they planning on going to Disney? Some. Are they studying English just to watch things on Netflix? Some. Are they planning on going to university overseas doing more work? Or are they planning on working in a business and making lots of money? So the first thing we need to know is why are they studying? And what do students think their future looks like? I think most of them today are pretty positive. They think they've got it in the bag. They have a little bit of education behind them. They've had a few years of English behind them and they feel that they can succeed. And automatically, they're going to go out like my ex-student here and become an analyst on CNN. Um, Leandro is one of my ex-students. He's now on CNN Brazil. Or my student here, Nicole, who hardly ever came to class but learned a lot. And what Nicole's done at 25 years old She's running a 2.6 million AIs, which is similar to Zwati right now, um, business with games. Um, she has teams from all over the world that compete. And she was written up as the Forbes under 30, 30 under 30 last year. So kids today think that they've got it made in their success. But what, in reality, does our future student look like, our current student's future look like? It's a clean slate. And the nice thing is we can be part of that future as educators of business English and skills. Now, you've all seen this. You've heard about the 21st century skills, the World Economic Forum talking about the declining um, skills we need and the growing skills for the future. Um, wake up call, we're two and a half months away from these predictions. And a lot of them 
have already come true. Now, the job landscape, we're heading more and more to IT. We're heading more and more to professional business. I don't know if you pay attention to the jobs in LinkedIn or anywhere in classifieds, but more and more here in Gdansk, every ad is looking for English at an advanced level, and they're testing for these jobs. So the future is English for the workplace. So don't be afraid when you hear business English. I know many teachers run away because they're afraid of the term. It's English for the workplace, and they need new competencies. The next report that came out is coming out for 2030, and it's the transformative competencies that students will need to have to enter the workplace of the future. And they talk about seven major skills and attributes for future employment. You notice management still, development, leadership, communication, technical and transferable competencies. Now, these are the seven main skills. And within those, there's 35 core competencies. I'm not going to go through them all. I'm just going to go quickly through. And you see things, there's leadership skills, management, reasoning, stress reduction, technical capabilities. So what are we dealing with? Now, depending on where you work and what your reality is, you may be working at a university with university students, or you could already be working with business professionals. In this case, we're looking to heavily deal with the communication skills. That's collaborative working, customer relations, social, persuasive techniques, and in business, writing skills, which most of our students are extremely weak at. And they've never probably been taught business writing skills. And of course, speaking and listening skills. Now, jobs that are at risk of automation in the future, you can see most of the basic jobs are going away because they can be automated. Good news, we're down here with doctors and lawyers, elementary school teachers, should still be around. They can't be automated yet. Give them time. But what does our current student's future look like? And who is the future user? When you think about it, in 2030, the people entering the job market is a 13-year-old today. So today's 13-year-olds are going to be our future workers in just eight years. Now, you all know about the 21st century skills. I'm not going to talk about them other than to show you this. But are we really giving them what they need? And what is school teaching students today? You know, I look at when I was a kid and I was in school 100 years ago, I had to memorize Shakespeare. Two months I spent trying to remember this soliloquy from, um, from Merchant of Venice. And for what? To use when? Think about it. I spent almost a year trying to memorize the periodic table of elements. We had to know everything. Now, you have the chat room, so I want you to type in the chat room. First of all, everybody say hi in the chat room. I want to make sure you're alive. All right, we have, okay, we got a couple people alive. Great. So you know where the chat room is. <laughs> so I want to see answers here. All right, a little quiz for you. 
What's the abbreviation of silicon? Ooh. Uh, Lucena, I thought I told you, no science people here. Just English teachers. Oh, you guys are good. SI. So, let's see. What's the abbreviation, then, of silver? Ooh. Eva, you're good. Boy, you guys are good. I don't remember them. What's the abbreviation of ridiculum? <coughs> it's BS. It doesn't exist. And what is antimony? Oh, it's an element. A-N. A-N. No, it's what I pay my ex-wives every month. No. A little levity. Right now, um, they're saying that 54% of the internet is in English. So think about w users worldwide. That's over half of the internet is in English right now. And over 50% of technical and scientific periodicals are in English. I will not go to a doctor who doesn't speak English because I know they haven't been able to read and haven't had access to all the information that's out there if they don't read English. In just a few years, 87% of globally-based jobs are going to require English. So that's a good news for us because we've got a lot of work ahead of us. So according to a documentary, 45% of today's jobs can be replaced with technology. We're seeing it already. I just stopped at the supermarket. Have you noticed they're getting rid of all the cashiers and everything is self-service now? I have to check myself out. I don't even see a cashier. Now, the argument. Which is more important, fluency or accuracy? Just put an F or an A. You don't have to type the whole thing. Both? No, no, both. <laughs> Fluency, fluency. All right, Irina, I owe you coffee, uh, coffee, chocolate. First one there. It depends, because think about it. Fluency, I agree. If you're talking general English for people that are tourists, taxi drivers, clerks, waiters, day-to-day -day people who are using English in a day-to-day -day situation. I agree, fluency is much more important. And that's what we should work at in general English. But, think about doctors, lawyers, teachers, business people. It's not fluency, it's accuracy. I realized this years ago when I was living in Brazil. I went to a doctor. We were talking in English for quite a while about golf because he was a big golfer, and I knew some of the places he used to play. When we turned to talking about my shoulder, he immediately switched to Portuguese. And I said, your English is perfect. Why not talk in English? He said, I cannot afford to make one word mistake in the conversation as a doctor. And that made me realize accuracy is more important when it comes to workplace English than fluency in most cases. So speaking, we're usually focused on meaning and context and communication. This is fluency. But when we get into writing, we should be more concerned about accuracy, grammar, content, and correctness. So we need, as always, to find the balance between the two. I'll tell you a little story about a company which will remain anonymous. This happened just about two months ago. 
you can't figure out who it is, I bet. Now, I teach one of the tax lawyers that works for this company, and we we're going through a contract. And I've been teaching lawyers for years in Brazil, most of them from oil and gas. So I have a pretty good idea about the tax laws over the years. And there was a statement written by somebody that says, our tax lawyer handles this. And I said, wait a minute. If I understand correctly, it's not the Brazilian tax lawyer that does it. It's the American tax lawyer that does it. And when we checked out the source, sure enough, she meant to say, your tax lawyer handles this. Now, it wasn't a mistake from a typo. She didn't understand the difference between our and your. That why made a huge difference. Because I caught that mistake, the previous company that I won't talk about saved a billion dollars in taxes. Now, I asked for a 10% finder's fee. They gave me a thank you. But one letter makes a difference. Think about how else one letter can make a difference. One letter. So accuracy becomes much more important. Now, look at today's workforce. It's changed. Because today's workforce is today's TikTok star, <laughs> tomorrow's workforce. And what we're also finding is the graying because people can't afford to retire. And we know, you know, I'm 100 years old, people older than me, most of them don't have a good command of English. I'm not talking teachers, I'm talking general public. This is why robots and machines become attractive. Perhaps what we need to do is we need to reevaluate what we're teaching our teens. And I'm talking about teens, high school, and even university, and even in coursework that we do right now. We should be working on interview skills. I got my first job at 15. We could be starting on interview skills, basic skills, to build confidence in middle school, in high school. The first interview should not take place when they graduate university and go looking for a job. They need experience. I spend time teaching interviewing skills all the time these days. We should teach them the basics of negotiation. We should be working on conflict, and I'm not talking about just bullying. I'm talking about conflict between them and their parents, them and their peers, them and their teachers. And it's not how to fight, it's how to work around fighting when there is a conflict by properly using language. We need to start teaching them business writing because they do not have the skills right now. We need to work more with collaboration. I know in Brazil, um, my stepdaughter in Brazil um, works in university. They have business programs for most of the majors. So they learn collaboration skills working in small businesses before they leave to get internships. Presentation skills. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm amazed that around the world that presentation skills are not taught at a younger age in school. And your first presentation shouldn't be taking place when you're in a job. And I'm dealing with this all the time, teaching presentation skills. Questioning. Now, as teachers, we ask a lot of questions and we elicit a lot of answers out of our students. But do we ever give them the chance 
to actually ask questions. Do they, we ever work on their skills on building a good question? Now, I find so many times I have to deal with executives who are going to meetings, taking um, part in conference calls. They understand the conversation. They can give an answer. But when they need to ask a question, they're afraid because they don't know how to put a good question together. So this is something I feel we should be working on. Just a little quote to break up the day. We need to work more with teaching them how to research and how to find out and where to find out what's true. You know, we're living in a new age, not that new, it's been going on for years, but we're aware of it now, fake news, fake information. I'm seeing all the time fake research. And I see people use in these talks research that was never actually done because nobody ever researched if the facts that they're copying from the Internet is true. So teaching them how to do proper research and how to find answers, not just using Google and trusting what comes up on Wikipedia. One skill I think we've really gotten away from, I find students do not know how to use a dictionary. You know, I grew up using a dictionary and encyclopedia, yes, by candlelight. Um, you know, we didn't have computers to go to back then. But they need to be able, even if they're using apps, they need to know the skills to properly use a dictionary. We should be working with these in classroom again. And my favorite is the thesaurus. I have a link to the thesaurus. I have loved this since I was about 15 years old. And I've always had a copy of Roger's thesaurus handy because if you're doing writing what better way to come up with synonyms online it's just as good i do a lot of writing promotional stuff everything i use it every day and students don't know it exists teach them how to use this i find that it's great i use it as a tool when a student learns a new word I automatically have them look that word up in the thesaurus and learn three to five synonyms for that word. Talk about building vocabulary quickly. Using YouTube for pronunciation and improving pronunciation. Um, we all know that by listening more and more to a speaker talking about something that they know, we can help to reduce our accent. I've had plenty of students who've been using friends for years. If you're talking with business students, have them find a talk on YouTube about the business they're in. I had a student one time who was going to work with Chinese engineers and we did a search on YouTube. Amazingly, a thousand videos came up. And they got to use it to improve listening skills, hearing a Chinese engineer talk about something. Other resources. Think about these. These are sometimes free resources. Now, the way I use these, let's say for argument's sake, I have my accountant in Brazil was my student. Now, she's a director level at one of the big four. So she's a brilliant accountant and a brilliant manager. But her English wasn't up to the level at the time. I had her take an accounting course for free on Coursera because she knows now the topic material. 
She knows how to do accounting, but now she hears in English the explanation of the accounting. And this helped her a lot, building up her ability to talk about it. And there's all sorts of courses on Coursera, Khan Academy, and Udemy. And I say to teachers, if you find a new, um, new set of students that you're working with, and you're working in a company, take a basic course in their job. Get to know what they're dealing with. Entrepreneurship. We had programs in the United States for starting entrepreneurs. Um, there's more and more in the school systems at high school level. Uh, as I said, in Brazil, they have some at university level. You should start entrepreneur clubs working in English getting people used to doing a business. Not everybody is going to be a TikTok star in the future, but they could come up with a brilliant app. They could come up with their own little micro business. They're going to need to know the terminology. They're going to need to know how to use graphics. You know, we see this today working with more and more with graphics. This is a skill that we need to be teaching them at a younger age, I feel. Frameworks. Hopefully everybody is familiar with this. Do you know what it is? Four little letters. Type it in the chat while I take a sip. Anyone? Irina, I know you know this. It's SWOT. It's a SWOT analysis. It's strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. No, with an O. <laughs> SWAT is the guys you call when, you know, you're going to go after terrorists. Um, this is one of the most basic frameworks that most people are familiar with. There are tons of more complex frameworks, and most people are afraid to work with them. If you start off slowly, start off with the basic SWAT, work with the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, teach them this while they're still young. Almost every job is going to require this in the future. Learning business applications. Now, by the time they get a job, there may be totally different apps on the market, but they're all built around the same basics. You see here I have things like Slack, uh, Trello, Jira, Miro, all these, yep. And get them to understand how to work with them now while they're young. Because they're going to need them in the future working in business. The other thing they're going to have to get used to, especially in the IT business, but more and more dealing with Agile, dealing with Scrum, dealing with Kanban. If you don't know these, you should start learning these yourselves. Because this is what you're going to be working with business professionals on. Now, they understand how these work, but they need the language to work with them. It's up to us to understand where they're coming from so we can properly help them for where they're going with their English. I'm still amazed today at how many C2 professionals in finance and economics, when they get a graph, they still say, it went up, it went down. There's so many different adjectives, adverbs, that we can use to describe graphs. I have a whole series that I've done on this. Help them to read graphs more than saying up, down. 
this is what's going to help them build their language and become more professional. In finance, invest and invest in yourself. Teach kids how to invest at a young age. Um, I taught my son. He's now got more money than me. You know, we need to teach this for the future. People are going to be dealing with money. People are going to be dealing in finance. And they need to know the terminology now. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to become a lawyer, but they could understand their legal rights. They could understand a legal contract. And what I'm amazed at is people around the world don't know their own consumer rights. Does anybody know if you buy a product, how many days do you have a legal right to return that product in your country? 14 in Ukraine? 14 in Poland? Well, it's 30 days in the United States, but most companies now opt for 90 days. Um, in Brazil, everybody says, oh, oh, three days. No, it's 30 days. Taxes. Start teaching people how to invoice, how to work with taxes, how to figure taxes, learn write-offs. These are basics that they can be learning in high school and university. Designing, this is going to be so important. Those of you who work freelance know this. Not only are we English teachers or tutors, now we have to come up with logos, ads. We have to have a website. We need branding. We're on social media. We need these skills being taught today. I like to teach my students how to become autonomous students because, quite frankly, language we know changes. I'm still learning. You know, I'm pushing 100 years old. I've been speaking English all my life, and I still learn new words every day because the language is changing. The language is growing. Old words are coming back again. So teach them to become autonomous. Have them use dictionaries. Have them find sources on new language. And an important one I think that nobody teaches is help them understand their self-worth and their value in themselves. This will become important in any business skill that they get in the future. Rapport is just as important that we do it, but they need to learn these skills also going into the future. Emotional intelligence, you hear them all the time. Diversity, I don't just mean gender diversity. I mean cultural diversity, diversity within the environment, social diversity. But culture, we need to make them more culturally aware. And we need to help them figure out how to be more culturally aware. There's great books on the market. I won't push them today. But we need to start learning intercultural skills. And we need to be teaching intercultural skills. And again, we can do this at university level easily. We usually have mixed university classes. We have exchange students. I started this years ago in 2013 when I was teaching in Brazil. I did this with my high school students. I connected with a teacher in Dusseldorf, Germany. We had kids the same age, same level, and they used to, basically they were like pen pals. They made short videos, they wrote to each other, and they talked to each other about the differences in their cultures. <coughs> Excuse me. Since then, 
um, another teacher that I used to work with has continued this program. And, in fact, they're working with programs in courses here in Brazil, in Poland, sorry, there in Brazil with some schools here in Poland. So set up these intercultural groups. Because I like to think if we start getting used to working and teaching, you know, not how we're different and how we differ in cultures, I think what we need to do is we need to start teaching how we're the same. Instead of going, what are the differences between our countries, our culture, the way we feel, why don't we find where we have things in common? Go at it from a positive point of view instead of a different point of view. We'll figure out the differences. And I like to say that instead of using how unlike we are, let's look at how alike we are, and then maybe we can start to like each other everywhere in the future. The basis is we need to teach them better skills for communication, is what it comes down to. Whether it's fluency, whether it's accuracy, and it's not through shouting, it's through whispering and talking to each other. And that's what I feel that we're blessed as teachers and we can help by making this transition to the boardroom because this is where we're going to be in the future. And this is what our students need for the future. I don't know of any student out there who's saying, I want English classes about diversity, about um, climate change. No, they're coming to us because they need it for their job. And we're talking about their future. So let's start them off earlier and let's teach them to listen and not just hear, and teach them to communicate, and not just speak. So, with all these things put together, I like to look at this as one huge puzzle, and we're the puzzle masters. We take everything that we've learned over the years, everything the student knows, everything that's out there for culture, and we put it all together, and we end up with a finished product. So, if you're not a member of IA Tefl Poland, you should be. <laughs> I hope you join. IA Tefl Poland has its own BSIG. We do things throughout the year. Jeff Tranter runs it. Uh, I've been around for years helping him out. We have face-to-face -face when we had them. Um, and join the IATEFL BSIG. We offer a lot, right, Arena? You can tell them. I know we have a lot of BSIG members here today. So this is how you reach me. And with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions, comments, or anything else. So, feel free, everybody turn your camera on and wave. Let me at least see your faces for a little bit. Don't be shy. I didn't do my makeup either, so I know. <laughs> any questions, any comments? This is step one. Tune in. Let me see. We have all sorts of dates. They're really putting me to work. I'll be here in December. <laughs> I'll be here in February. They want me in June. So I'm going to step up and start talking more and more about more complex things in business English. And 
Um, I hope you join for all of them. Can you get a copy of the presentation? It's available for 1,000 euro. <laughs> Contact me later. Send me a message. We'll see. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. You'll take two, right? <laughs> so, comments. Come on, you don't be shy. <clears throat> I hope you can understand my voice. Sorry, it's breaking up. I think all right. Well, we should all say that we are really grateful to you. You know, it's like two hundred percent grateful, great, more grateful because of the problems with your voice. That is really tough allergy, and really <sighs> creating a problem. And still, you are with us. So I'm sure that we all appreciate it. I wouldn't miss it for the world. <laughs> it's, um, I'd like to hear from some people who have been teaching business English. How did you make the change? Irina, come on. Don't be shy. You mean me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, telling honestly, I don't remember the time when I haven't been teaching business English. Now, it was probably when I first started to work for the academic purpose. Mm -hmm. But then uh, I've been offered uh, a job in, in IT companies. And since the year 2006, I've been working there. Yep. And there's a lot of work there, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, this is, um, you probably saw Roxana the other day. Roxana in the Ukraine teaches IT. I'm teaching IT in Russia, um, uh, Belarus, Poland, Estonia. You know, it's wonderful. IT is the big one. And you know what? They're making good money so they can afford to pay. And really, um, it's not that difficult. Remember, these people already know how to do business. This is one of the things that I laugh sometimes because some people say, oh, well, you know, um, I'm teaching them leadership skills. You know, they wouldn't have gotten a job as a manager if they didn't have leadership skills in their own language. You can talk about leadership skills in English, though. We're not teaching them business. We're teaching them how to talk about business. And that's an important distinction. Fortunately for me, I have a business background. It helps, but it's not 100% necessary. But I think if you're smart... You'll learn from your students. I, When I started teaching in Brazil and I started getting lawyers, I ended up with about 250 lawyers. Most of them were all oil and gas. I know more about oil and gas law than I ever wanted to. But this is how I learned, and this is how I help future people. Because I said, okay, you work in IT, teach me. So, which is the link? Uh, that's for you. I'm not handling certificates. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm just uh, finding the email address of Marcin, yes? I am okay. from Poland, Great. yes. I am in the process of uh, writing the message. You're there. wonderful. Who is who? So just to copy Martin's address, email address, and and everybody will be able to contact Martin about the certificate. So that has been taken care of. You can continue telling us all those really, really important 
uh, things about teaching uh, business English, but really business English. And I really appreciate that you said that we teach language, yes, because that's what some of us are really concerned about, that uh, we have to know business. So we can learn business from mm -hmm. our students. And that's that's what I do in my classroom as well, by yep. swapping the roles, yes? Uh, yep. They become teachers. They are so happy to be uh, teaching their teacher and uh, and we learn together. That's the idea. It, it's really wonderful because that's, that's where the language comes out. When they can really talk about and teach somebody else what they do, it's great. And they appreciate it it helps them build confidence that they can talk about what they know and you fix their problems as you go you work on the grammar if they make mistakes you help them with pronunciation um i just somebody i i was walking down the street today with a friend of mine um somebody that i've known for five and a half years and she said depot It's Depot. I didn't realize, you know, that she had never heard this word. It's the things we take for granted. Now, a professional business person would feel embarrassed if they said Depot and got caught and nobody knew what they meant. So this is the best way to work on it is talk about the things that they do every day and i i did this today with one of my students i went back and asked the same questions that i asked six months ago i recorded the answers both times and when she realized how much she had learned to use in communicating the answer she was blown away and it motivated her to want to work harder. But it gave her the confidence to stand up and talk to clients and coworkers. It's practice. Practice, practice. Who else? You guys need practice talking. I don't. <laughs> talk to me, talk to me. Rob, may I ask you? You just did. <laughs> what would you recommend to those who teach uh, pre-experienced students? Meaning pre-experienced for what? From like the university. So, for instance, um, when we are talking about in-company uh, lessons, so it's pretty easy because you can uh, first be exposed to the mm -hmm. context and they can bring and share and you can how to say work with it but yep. uh, when you teach our first year sophomores and so on from the university who are mm -hmm. on the way to get prepared mm -hmm. to be employed in the future so yeah. they still don't know even uh, they can have some guesses but they don't know where exactly they will work so sure. how to find this context Two things you have to do first. Are they English students learning about business or are they business students learning English? So first you got to decide, you know, where they're coming from. Um, Jeff Tranter does a wonderful talk about this. And this is, it's because it's two different ways of teaching. Um, if I had students with a good level of English studying business, and they don't know what they want to do, I would do a lot of different things. Number one, what does your father do for a living? Okay, tell me about your father's job. They know what their father does, usually, or mother. They know what their partner does if they're married. Talk about a job that they know. Talk about a job that they might anticipate, what they think the job entails and have them do some research about it. I like to do a lot with role playing and to work on the basics, you know, negotiation. I'll tell you, okay, Arena, you're a nasty customer 
who wants your money back. So you challenge me to deal with conflict and to deal with negotiation without losing my temper. And then I'll turn it around with another student and somebody will be a nasty customer service rep dealing with a polite customer. You know, all different things. Role play. Take advantage of what they do know. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then make them do some homework and make them, make them figure out on something that they may want to be. And if they say they want to be a teacher, talk them out of it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, Rob, you were talking about you were talking about uh, about making them think positive. Yes. So uh, in my classroom, I, I ask my students, you know, uh, when when they don't have uh, haven't had any job, uh, to imagine the job of their dreams. Yes. yes. So they dream. Yes. And they think positive, and that brings this positive energy into the process of creating your professional future. Yes. yes. And you can follow up with perfect interview, uh, perfect assessment uh, interview, so interview for the job, assessment mm -hmm. interview, and so on. That's great. This is the whole thing. It's use your imagination. Um, I was going to say, don't use a book. Um, okay. You know, talking about books and everything like that, books are good tools. But you're not going to open up a business English book. I don't care. My friends write some of them. Sorry to say it. But you're not going to open up a business really English book. Enraged. <laughs> yeah. They're good tools. You can use them. Like a dictionary is a tool. Thesaurus is a tool. You know, use it as a tool. But you really need to learn to be creative as a teacher. I think the more creative you are, like imagining your future job, your dream job. Talk about that. That beats a book any day. Mm -hmm. That help? Yeah. Good. I'll be sending you a bill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> I'm kidding. What else? Any other comments? Who's here who hasn't taught business English yet and is now motivated to do it? Anyone? See, all experienced teachers. Well, that's good. I hope I wasn't too basic for you, but I wanted to start off with the basics and we'll work up. Um, we'll talk about... What would you like to know about? What would you like to learn in the upcoming talks? Throw it in the, turn on your mic or put it in the chat room. What would you like to hear for the future? Someone is raising his hand, Ekbal. Ekbal, what would you like to? Turn on your microphone. Okay, Hi. Yeah, we can okay, hear okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I want to know how to do show my students via like Zoom app. I think it is a little bit difficult to deal with the students if they are far away from us and how to give them, I mean, the information in a creative way, like how to, to make it creative and at the same time, how to let them, I mean, understand and be active with us like this. So, really, are you saying the difficulty of working on Zoom and not face-to-face? -face? Is that the question? Yes, a little bit. For example, when I teach some students, like, uh, via Zoom, I feel that I can't, I mean, uh, deal with them and let them be, like, active. Got it. So, I feel that uh, it's pouring a little bit when I try to teach them via Zoom. Yeah. And how can I avoid this thing? My personal opinion on this <laughs> is I've been teaching online for over 20 years. And you guys, you know, pretty much just most of you had to start because of the pandemic. I've been doing it for years. I think we as teachers 
are making excuses that saying teaching online isn't as good as face-to-face. -face. Now, I've met probably five or six of you here face-to-face. -face. Irina, I haven't seen you now for a couple of years since I got my chocolate. <laughs> but I've seen you online many times, and I don't feel we have any difference in our rapport or our relationship. In fact, the thing I like about online is I can see micro expressions when Irina thinks I'm crazy or she doesn't understand. And these are things I probably couldn't have seen in the classroom. So I, you know, yes, we can't hug. We can't, I don't know how many kisses you're supposed to give here. We can't hug, we can't exchange gifts, we can't hit clean glasses and say cheers. But there's nothing that I cannot do with her online to successfully teach her what she needs. So I think teachers use this as a little bit of an excuse and they should stop because online is here to stay. You know, if you're working in university, yeah, you're going to go back to school. Most businesses are re-looking at how they do in company classes, and they don't want teachers coming back in. They're going to stay online. I'm staying online because, look, I have this beautiful starry sky. It's wonderful. I have more resources at my fingertips, and so do my students, because I'm online. And the only disadvantage is all of you, except for Irina, are too cowardice to turn on your cameras, which, quite frankly, I do not take it on students who won't turn on their camera, because that's what we need we need to see each other at least, at least virtually yes yeah so i don't think i think if you get this idea out of your mind i can't do this you'll be great online teacher because again nothing you cannot do andre you agree with me great. thank you so much Oh, thank you. <laughs> Andre, yeah, turn it on was your a mini, uh, sorry. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good advice. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you again. Uh, you're welcome. Good luck. And make them turn on their cameras. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, inshallah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. I'll do my makeup next time too, all right? <laughs> Rob, will you share a couple of not tips? Not a matter of how... myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's not a matter of myself, actually. It's a matter of another issue. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Irina. Yeah. Uh, will you share a couple of uh, suggestions how to encourage students to switch on the camera if they are reluctant to do it? Do you have oh, your I, personal recipe, probably? Yeah, I tell them right up front. I'm sorry if you're not going to turn on your camera. You need to find another teacher. Because a lot of what I do, I need to see you. I'm going to help you with pronunciation. I need to know what you understand, what you don't understand. I said, you know, when's the last time you watched a movie like this? So I, I've dropped a few students because of that. And, you know, from time to time, yeah, there's a problem. The camera doesn't work. Um, the bandwidth is bad. Yeah, that's a different story. But, I mean, if they won't turn on their camera, they need to find another teacher because I'll find somebody else who's willing to do the work, you know. 
I want commitment. And I tell them, if you know, if you want me to commit to teaching you, I need you to commit to working. Oh, great negotiation tip. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> Hi, yeah, Maria, did some, you have a question? Hi. Go ahead. Yes, hello. My name is Maria Cristina. Uh, I am from Buenos Aires, Argentina. It's been a pleasure listening to you. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I teach uh, primary school kids and high school kids at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm planning to study uh, to become um, to specialize in business English. I know it's difficult, mm -hmm. but you know. it's, it's challenging. But I think it's challenging. Better. So it was very interesting to listen to you. Thank you, and also Great. your your advice about cameras off, uh, which is really very upsetting. Yeah, uh, it's very useful, uh, and I think your your uh, decision to um, to stop them from doing that uh, is really mm. uh, very thoughtful. You know, there's there's a lot of students out there. Don't be so desperate that you know. If, if I have a student who keeps canceling class, you know, we have eight classes a month. If they show up for three, I say, look, find another teacher. I want students who are committed to succeeding. And that's what I want to work with, you know. And good luck. You're in Buenos Aires? Yes, it's yes the Buenos home. Aires. I am from Argentina. Yeah, it's the home of my favorite restaurant, Sigala Vaca. Yeah, definitely. I live like 20, I mean, five minutes away. Oh, I'm jealous. I'm coming to visit someday. I, I take walks every day along Puerto Madero, which is the area surrounding yeah. the restaurant. And, well, you will, you'll enjoy that if you ever come to Argentina. Oh, I've been there twice already, so I love it. It's great. <laughs> You'll be always welcome. Good. Thank you. Gracias. More restaurants? Any recipes, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> in, in Krakow, there are many of, of really nice places. So when you come, you will be able to discover for yourself. Good. Krakow is the most beautiful Polish city. There is no other city like Krakow in, in Poland. So whoever comes to Poland, you have to visit Krakow. <laughs> Number one on the list. Robert, we are still here. waiting for you in Kiev. Yes. <laughs> I'm that was a big disappointment. Yeah. I think that shut down what a week right before I was supposed to be there. Hmm. But we'll deal with it. How about Poland? Are any any of you from Poland? Are you traveling and gonna do something face to face? Are they doing any face-to-face -face stuff? No, not really. N nothing, huh? Mm -hmm. I'd like to do it on a small scale. I, uh, there's one coming up in Tow Run in a couple of weeks that I'm going to be there. Mm -hmm. So if you're in Tow Run, come and say hi. <laughs> Great. Questions, comments? Maybe you can open a bit the door to our annual BASIC conference. What kind of uh, speech you're going to provide there? Are you going to present? <laughs> <laughs> Any yes, promo? actually. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I've been working all day on it. And so it just like didn't even cross my mind. In November, November. Uh, 14, oh. yes. 12, there's two. From 12 yeah. till 14. 12, yeah. 13, 14. Yep. We have our annual three-day conference. Usually we're face-to-face, -face, but last year and this year, of course, will be online. Um, and BSIG members, of course, it's very... Irene, do you remember the prices? I don't even... It's, like, very inexpensive. Sounds like peanuts. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, I think it's 10 or 15 pounds mm -hmm. and if you're a non-member you know why why are you a non-member 
but it's <laughs> it's not that much. We made it very inexpensive because it's online. But I'll I'll be doing a debate with my friend Anya Kobyshevska on world Englishes. <laughs> if you were in Brazil at uh, Brazil, Berlin, I did a debate a couple of years ago, which was mm-hmm. fun. So we'll be doing that. And the other one I'm going to do a talk on is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Mm. Which is basically, if any of you were on social media advertising like crazy to get students, perhaps you shouldn't be. So it's is the effort you're putting into your marketing really paying off? Because some people are going crazy on social media. And I think there's better ways that they could be getting students, like becoming a better teacher or <laughs> learning new skills, you know? So that's what my talk will be about. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And then my forward. business... Good. And then my business partner is going to teach you how to do this in her talk after mine. <laughs> so it should be fun. But we got a lot of, a lot of, um, we've got two great plenaries. We've got a uh, conversation with Fierce, the person who came up with the Fierce concept. Uh, we're going to have an interesting panel, the open forum, of course. And lots of great talks, which I'm excited to hear. We have Andres here. Andre will be speaking with mm-hmm. with Anya. So join us. That's if you go to just easy. It's bsig.org. That will take you to the website, and you find all the information. And that way, you know, you become an IATEFL Poland member, then you'd be an affiliate, and then you become an IATEFL member, and you're part of the BSIG. And Liz, you're doing a talk too, right? Yeah. You're talking on Friday, I think, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. See? Yes, yes. What are you talking about? Uh, I'm. I'm talking about uh, professional context versus uh, business English classroom, yes? So business as usual, what is business as usual for us business English teachers? That's basically yep. Great. And again, people, don't be afraid when you hear the words business English. Because it isn't that scary. You know, I kind of liked it for a while before I got involved in the BSIG because that kept you guys away. And then working online, it kept you away. So I had lots of customers. But now I want you all to be successful and all to be business English teachers. Good. I'm going to Buenos Aires. Yay! <laughs> fascinating chat with you. You are really managing very well. I would like to say that I wrote in the chat box uh, that I like to use uh, uh, expression professional English, yes? Because it's it's not it's always nice. business organizations. It's, it, yeah. You have to be able to communicate at university and all kinds of non-profit organizations, yes? And then, yep. then it's more edible, I think. <laughs> That's nice. I, you know, I thought about it, you know, we thought about career English, workplace English, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. English for life. I like professional English. That's nice, too. Great. All right. So, that it? Am I, am I dismissed? No, no, you are not dismissed. You are admired <laughs> for being able to stay with us so long. And I'm sure that Irina will provide the, your chocolate. As chocolate lover, I support your letter of application. 
<laughs> so uh, you will be provided chocolate and when you go uh, uh, to Spain, Maria will host you at your favorite restaurant. Yeah, and Argentina. Waffles, then mm -hmm. I will uh, <coughs> do a tour, tour around Krakowian restaurants. <laughs> My okay. pleasure. My pleasure, definitely. Great. <laughs> I, I want everybody to invite me for food, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we are also food lovers, so food is, food is one of those things that should be really at the center of business also, yes? You can, you can yep. make people, you can create a, a perfect negotiation setting if you take somebody to a restaurant, yes? Mm -hmm. So you have to know which food is good, which shouldn't be offered. Although that's a little difficult to do online, unless we both go to a McDonald's and we meet. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are becoming really creative with these online yeah. options. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very sure. much. Thanks so, a lot. Uh, uh, thank I you. am closing the meeting right now, officially. Let's wave goodbye, see sure. each other. And then Thanks, bye -bye. Nice meeting, all of you. Thank you, really. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Stay bye safe. bye. Stay safe, bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Nice to meet you bye. all. Bye.